Hello everybody and welcome back to another video from HSTV and in today's video as you can see by the video title we are doing part 2 of the ECG series. Today we will be looking at how to actually read an ECG and the ECG reading algorithm so you can step by step break down an ECG confidently. Now if you haven't already please do check out part 1 first as this will be a continuation before you hop into part 2. Now if you're new to the channel and you don't know who I am, my name is Heen Shima. I'm a fifth year medical student here at the University of Edinburgh and without further ado, let's jump into this part two. All right, so welcome back, um, part two then. So yeah, we're gonna really focus all our energy to the ECG now. Hopefully you have watched the first part, which was the ECG combined with the cardiac cycle. But today we are moving straight into the ECG, thinking about all these different elites. Now, you know probably that this is called a 12 lead ECG, but practically, um, if you've actually done an ECG on someone or maybe had one yourself, you only have 10 electrodes and people get this mixed up. They think that um, you have, you're supposed to have like 12 electrodes since it's called a 12 lead ECG, but you need to remember that leads and electrodes are different. Um, lead, I like to think of as a circuit. So you're actually measuring the electrical conductivity of the heart in 12 different circuits, but using only 10 electrodes. Now these electrodes, they are placed in the following locations. So normally on your right limb somewhere, the left uh, limb as well, upper limb, and then your lower limbs as well, as well as your chest leads from V1 to V6 that are positioned like so. Um, and yeah, definitely if you're a medical student and you're on the wards, there's lots of ECGs being done all the time. So I highly recommend that you get involved and actually do an ECG on somebody yourself and uh, see it in action. So yeah, very quickly to um, clarify that point then. So 12 lead ECG means that we are measuring the heart's electrical conductivity from 12 different circuits using 10 electrodes. Okay, so into the limb leads then. So what we are measuring is from the right arm to the left arm. Okay, so we're measuring electrical conductivity going that way. And you can see that the heart is there. So we're measuring, you know, kind of horizontally-ish. Remember the heart is sort of positioned a bit diagonally and in everybody it's a bit different. We'll talk more about cardiac axis after as well. But yeah, so vaguely we're measuring from the right arm to the left arm and that is called lead one okay so when we have lead one we are getting a pattern that sort of looks very similar to our lead two now we spoke a lot about lead two last time because that was really measuring the electrical conductivity of the heart going diagonally in this direction it was a very nice uh, pattern to follow we had the negative electrode up here and the positive electrode up here now you can see actually how that correlates to real life because that negative electrode is actually representative on the right arm and the left limb at the bottom here would be representative of uh, the positive electrode and that's why we got this pattern but actually the patterns that you see in leads one and three as well are all very similar to that of lead two with a few perhaps um, differences in the heights uh, of these um, waves. And if you go through, like we did with lead two, every uh, single part of the cardiac cycle and going through each part of depolarization and then repolarization of the heart, and you played it through like we did for this negative electrode here to the positive electrode here, and you flipped it around or you did uh, you know, the positive here and the negative here, you would come out with a similar similar pattern to lead two. So for the most part, when we look at leads one, two, and three on the ECG, we want to see a P wave going up. We want to see a Q wave coming down. Well, hardly coming down. We'll talk more about Q waves, but you know, a slight downward deflection of the Q wave, if that or nothing. We also have the R wave going up the way. We've got S wave coming down and then T wave also pointed up. So one, two, and three should all vaguely show that same pattern. The augmented leads. So this is your AVR, your ABL, and your AVF. They are measuring electrical conductivity, as you can see uh, here. So 
this is not like a strict electrode that you're placing on somebody, but this is more measuring from a, a negative electrode here towards a positive. And really, AVR is the only lead that should show the opposite of all the other leads. So where you would expect a P wave going up the way, you now have the P wave going down the way, the Q wave coming up the way rather than down, the R wave rather than a big, nice positive deflection, it's now going down. And, uh, you know, same with the S wave, it's opposite and the T wave is also now a downward deflection. And the reason for that is because if you look at it, you know, before we had our negative electrode up here and our positive here, this time we've actually got a negative on this side and a positive on this side. So, of course, when we have the heart being positively charged and positive charges moving towards a negative electrode now, we are naturally going to get downward deflections. And that is why you have a total reversal of our normal ECG waveform in AVR. So if in AVR you see everything looking a little bit weird and pretty much the opposite of what it should look like, that is totally normal and that's what it should be like. Of course, if you don't know how the ECG waveform is forming, then this becomes very confusing and you might think there's something wrong with the patient, but there's actually nothing wrong with them at all. And the way I remember this, ABR, R for reversal. So I just remember it like it's a reversal of the normal, it is um, the total opposite. AVL should be showing a similar pattern to um, the other leads as well. This is the direction that it's measuring the conductivity in and AVF as well. Again, quite similar to lead to actually with the, pos with the positive electrode down here and the negative electrode up here. It's not as diagonal as the lead two was, but kind of similar to that. But again, for the most part, our charges are flowing in a similar direction to what we saw in lead two and therefore uh, we should be getting a normal waveform. The chest leads are sort of working in their own fashion here um, and you'll actually see if you look from V1 to V6 you'll see some differences in the R wave and the S wave. This is called R wave progression. It can be quite useful when you're um, thinking about like hypertrophy and things like that. Um, R wave progression, what that means is that the R wave tends to get taller as you move from V1 to V6 and the S wave tends to get smaller as you go from V1 to V6. So you can see the S wave has gone quite small, the R wave has grown and become taller. And really this is measuring from the middle of the heart, you could sort of say, and it's a bit difficult to show on a 2D diagram, but on a 3D model it would really be coming out the way, out the heart and measuring um, like that. Quite important actually is to mention that all these are positive electrodes again. So what this means is that you would expect a normal uh, ECG waveform. The only difference being that your R wave and your S wave would have this sort of progression showing up, but you still should have normal waveform. Okay, really quite important actually. This is uh, the slide that you should take a screenshot of. Summary of your leads. Very important when you're reading an ECG because you want to know where in the heart something is wrong. So when you're looking at leads 2, 3 and AVF, you're looking at the inferior wall of the heart. Okay, and I remember it like this. So leads 2 and 3, uh, you'll have to remember on your own, but AVF you can remember with inferior. So the F is like inferior. Okay, so we are looking at 2, 3, AVF are looking at this little part of the heart here. We then have the lateral wall of the left ventricle being measured here from leads 1, AVL, V5 and V6 and you know you can go back in the video and you can uh, go back the slides and you can see exactly where we are measuring but remember with V5 and V6 we had them pointing out this way just as a quick reminder okay so we're looking at the lateral wall of the left ventricle again you can remember that with AVL so L being lateral wall of the left 
ventricle, okay? Nicer way to remember it, I guess. Um, so yeah, one ABL, V5 and V6, looking at the lateral wall of the left ventricle. We then have the lateral wall of the right ventricle, that's being measured by ABR, V1 and V2. So ABR, so again R, looking at the wall of the right ventricle, that's how I remember it. And then we are left with V1 to V4 and that is your anteroseptal region. Again, remember this is a 2D diagram but in 3D if we've got that circuit coming out, measuring out of the heart towards a positive electrode at more of a perpendicular angle, then we have got V1 to V4 before V5 and V6 branches out towards the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So yeah, I would say you should memorize this slide. It will help you a lot unless you want to sort of work it out um, as you go as well that's fine too now very important cardiac anatomy so again this is showing you a normal ECG but this time I've labeled on a few sections on here so remember we had leads 2 3 and AVF looking at the inferior wall of the heart that certain part of the heart it has blood supply coming from the right coronary artery. Okay, now why is that important? Because if we see changes in leads 2, 3 or AVF, we can say very confidently that there's something going on in the inferior part of the heart, but more importantly, there is something wrong at the right coronary artery. So perhaps, you know, if there's a blockage in that artery and we're having an MI or something happening there, then we're going to see changes in these three leads. And this is how we can identify where in the heart something has gone wrong, rather than just saying, ah, yeah, something doesn't look, like, look right in ABF. But to apply that knowledge to real life and say, okay, well, there's something wrong in the inferior part of the heart, meaning that we need to look to the right coronary artery. Now, likewise, the lateral leads, one AVL, V5 and V6, they are supplied by the left circumflex artery. So again, we want to be applying that knowledge to the left circumflex artery. And then, quite nicely, you get this uh, kind of upside down L shape uh, for the left anterior descending artery running from V1 to V4, looking at your anterior septal regions, okay? So again, if you see a change in V1 to V4, you know that there's something wrong with the left anterior descending artery. Now, something else to be aware of just with these arteries, some places use some abbreviations. So this is normally called your RCA, right coronary artery. This is normally called your LAD, so your LAD, your left anterior descending. And this is called your LCA, left circumflex artery. So this is how the ECG, as you can see now, is no more just uh, some squiggly lines on a pink sheet of paper we now understand exactly why waves are moving up and down. We now understand what each section correlates to on the heart. And we also understand what the blood supply for each of these regions is, which is very important when it comes to actually managing heart conditions. Now, as you can see here, actually, AVR is sort of excluded and we're just going to leave it excluded for now um, and it kind of becomes a little bit relevant when we think about cardiac axis but um, for the most part it's uh, it shouldn't really be showing anything more than uh, the upside down of your normal waveform. Okay so mention cardiac axis a few times here now I don't want you to worry too much about this. As a medical student, at least, this is not something that you're expected to know a lot about. Um, at least that's the case in the UK. Can't speak for all curriculums, but I did put this slide in because I do think it's important. What this is really representing is that the heart in our body is supposed to sit at a normal angle of about you know like 60 degrees kind of like that and this is why our lead two works out so nicely because it's showing a nice negative to positive um electrode circuit in the direction that the heart is placed 
Now, the problem is in some people, you can have the heart move more towards a left deviation or have more of a right deviation. And in those cases, obviously those electrodes are measuring the heart's conductivity at a greater or lesser angle, and that affects the waves on the ECG. For example, in a right axis deviation, for example, lead one is actually upside down. It's actually switched the other way around. And similarly, um, you know, in lead three, it, it would be down for a left axis deviation. Again, this uh, is supposed to show you um, a bit more of an explanation to your normal QRS angle, uh, where lead two is showing a good plus 60 degrees, a positive 60 degree angle. Um, you know, with uh, AVF, that shows it kind of going down the way. Remember, that's an inferior angle and it's at 90 degrees. But really, this is all to do with the angle of the heart placement, which can change from different pathophysiologies. It can also be congenital as well. But yeah, just to be aware of it, I think it's more important that you understand the normal physiology and um, the kind of arrhythmias that go along with that, rather than um, you know, you know, getting yourself too caught up on cardiac axes because it can be confusing. Okay, so this is a uh, really quite important now. You need to know how to read an ECG. And to understand that, it's good to have an algorithm that you can follow. Now, the algorithm that I like to use is RRPWQST. Now, I did try to make a mnemonic out of this. Um, it was proving a bit difficult, but you can uh, have something like, um, if I can remember, it even <laughs> wasn't very good, but something like rabbits run past weird, quiet, sleepy turtles. Um, I don't know how memorable that is, but I hope it can help somebody. Um, what that really represents though is, first of all, the first R is for rate. You want to, first of all, when you're confronted with an ECG, you want to calculate the rate. You want to know beats per minute. And to do that, it will be quite useful for you to know the rhythm. That is the second R. You need to know if the rhythm is regular or irregular. And to be honest with you, you could probably swap these R's around as well. You could do these the other way around. You could do rhythm first and then rate, because there's two ways of calculating rate that we're going to come on to. And uh, it kind of differs depending on whether you've got a regular or irregular heart rate. Um, next up, you look at your P wave. Now your P wave is gonna tell you, are we in sinus rhythm? Because remember, all the way back in part one, we said that the action potential is initiated at the sinoatrial node. That's normal conduction. That's where the action potential is supposed to be produced. And if it's being produced there, then we know that we are in sinus rhythm. We have a normal upward deflecting P wave. Next, you look at the width and specifically the width of the QRS complex. So remember that ventricular depolarization part. And if that is more than three small squares on your ECG, then that's indic indicative of a ventricular problem because it's showing ventricular depolarization. Therefore, if something is wrong in that region, then you know that it's indicating a ventricular problem. Okay. Next up, you look at the Q wave. Now, a Q wave, I mentioned this before, but we don't want it to be deep. It should really be very small or almost non-existing. And if you do have a deep Q wave, then that could be indicating a previous MI. Now, why would it be indicating a previous MI? Well, if you think about it, you know, all the way back in part one, we said that the Q wave is all about, again, thinking about ventricular um, depolarization and specifically that septal depolarization, right? Now, if you have an area of uh, MI and uh, somewhere in the heart has been subject to scarring or fibrosis, you may have a prolongation of the charges passing through. And when you have a prolongation of charges moving through the septum, for example, and you have a deeper Q wave, well, that's just showing you that there's a region of 
something has happened here before. Uh, normally in the heart, that is a previous MI, which has left some scarring resulting in a prolongation of that charge moving through the heart. Again, very important that you understand the basics. Otherwise, me just telling you that a deep Q wave is showing a previous MI, it's going to go over your head. So it's quite important to think about why does a deep Q wave indicate a previous MI. Now, the other segment, this is this popular segment that we hear a lot about when we're thinking about MI, STEMIs, non-STEMIs, that is the ST segment. So is it above or below the baseline? And is it indicating ischemia? And again, an upside down T wave could also be indicating ischemia. So that is your little algorithm to be aware of, RRP, W, Q, S, T. Now, going on to heart rate then. So remember I said that there are two ways of calculating the heart rate, okay? So you can either do 300 divided by the number of large squares between your R waves. This is the method that's probably most reliable that you can do uh, most easily. But you do have another method that sometimes might be useful and that is to do six times the number of QRS complexes. And I'm talking specifically about lead two. Um, and the reason I say lead two is because on a normal ECG, let's just go back a few slides to a normal ECG. What you'll see is, um, obviously this ECG doesn't show you it, um, very well, but at the bottom normally, they give you a strip um, uh, ECG as well and that's giving you a longer run through and normally that is lead two. and what can happen sometimes is if you've got an irregular rhythm then it might be a bit difficult to actually count the number of large squares between R waves since that number could be irregular and therefore sometimes it's just easier to do six times the number of QRS complexes so it kind of matters what type of rhythm you've got. But for the most part, method one works for regular rhythms and method two works for your irregular rhythms. All right, guys, so I'm gonna end part two there. And in the next part, we will be talking more and going more into in depth with different types of ECGs you are likely to encounter. Um, but yeah. All right, everybody, well, that is going to be the end of this video, this part. There will be another part coming soon as well, or it might already even be here, where we will be looking at common arrhythmias and really examinable content that's likely to come up. So make sure you do go and watch that as well. But yeah, as always, if you've got any questions or anything that you're not too sure about, leave it down in the comments or you can DM me or email me. So yeah, I'll catch you all in the next video. Goodbye. Oh,